thank you. Good evening. We are in Paris. That's the last <coughs> evening of the of the summer for the type talk, and uh, we are happy to be with you from uh, abroad, from any place in the world, watching us in same time that all these people in Paris. Uh, tonight we have two excellent speakers. Uh, we will start with uh, Stéphane Elbaz, and um, he will uh, giving a talk uh, for about one hour. We will have a break. We'll be off, and we'll come back with the second talk with Summerstone. So for now, I will present uh, Stéphane Elbaz, who count a lot of me for me. Um, Stéphane is um, is um, a graphic di designer who is based in New York. But I have a story with Stefan to, to tell you about a little bit, to introduce the talk of Stefan. First time I met Stefan was simply to refuse him the access to my type design class in NSAD back in 2003. So at the time, the class was small, and uh, it was uh, anyone can came. So but the first who arrived uh, accepted the other uh, uh, refused for the year. And Stefan was um, you, are, you were the 14 or the 15, so it was stopped at 14 seats. And Stefan, um, Stefan try, uh, um, tried to be back the next year. And he was accepted because it was on the first people <laughs> this time. <laughs> but I realized very much uh, the second year, or the first year with Stefan, but second try of Stefan, that Stefan was very good at designing typeface. Um, I got he, he got immediately the right eyes to visualize letter form counters and play with them. I never have seen someone with this ability from the first day as him in my long career as a teacher. After he left NSAD, we lost contact a little bit, but he continued to design typeface. He came back at Tipo Fonry for a summer in 2007 or 8, I don't recall exactly, to complete his Geneo typeface. In fact, he has a couple of typeface at the time, and he asked to me, which one I have to continue, or something like that. And I say, yeah, you know, it can be a good candidate, something like that. And he said, okay, okay, I will continue to work on it for a few weeks at Tipo Fonry. And uh, so he sent the typeface at the TDC and got an award for, for it a few months later. So, okay, it proves that he has some, some capacity to design typeface. Um, this typeface, we published it in 2012 at Tipo Fonry. In 2008, he moved to New York um, he, he, so to, st to start a new, a new career, um, a, new, uh, a new life uh, in New York. And very quickly, he began to work in a digital publication. So he joined uh, uh, an ad agency. And for this agency, I've done, conducted a lot of redesign of good publications like Vanity Fair, L LA Times interview and many other. So uh, Stefan was something, someone quite important in New York, designing a good publication online with a basis from uh, NSAD school or even Swiss school, but adap adapted to the to the web design, but with more larger way to see uh, all the design can be on, on, on the screen. Um, he was also, when he left this company, he, he joined a new company called The Intercept. And for this publication, he got the, the change to design the publication from by, by itself, from the logotype to the layout and even to design typeface. So he's probably the first designer in the world to be able to design a publication, to do the identity, to, do, uh, to design the typeface for the launch of the publication online. Generally, when a new publication is launched online or on paper, the type designer is not the one who does the design, it's a team of people. And Stefan was able to do everything um, all together alone. Um, I, was, I was in New York in 2012, invited by Summerstone on Cara Di Eduardo for Type Cooper uh, to teach there. It was an influence to launch Type Paris later, but at this time, I, because Stefan was in, in New York, I said, Stefan, could you join me to teach for five weeks? And he said, uh, yes, he never teach at the time, but we spent a very uh, good moment together in for, for the five weeks there. there. So, um, so in 2014, one, we have the idea to launch Type Paris. 
uh, we've got a call with Summerstone on, on Cardi Eduardo. I will come back to this story a little later. And then, so when, when we get the, the idea that it was possible to do it, I ask uh, naturally to Stefan to do the identity of, of Type Paris so that it's logotype, identity, you have done the website, all the systems that we, we use, and even he designed such thing we have on the screen. On, on, uh, obviously, Stefan was on the core team of Type Paris from the first day. Even the first people working on the Type Paris program with me and with Veronique, and then p other people joined. But so to have Stefan here as uh, um, instructor, teacher for the week, it's absolutely wonderful after the, to be on the first on the third year of the Thai Paris. So um, I can say that I admire, as a, uh, admire Stéphane as a talented creative director, a talented uh, typeface designer. Uh, Stéphane is on my smallest circle ever. He's the one, it's sort of young brother by heart as well as Aaron Levin who is not there tonight. So these, these two people, that's the first people I ask when I need advice on anything. So they are very close people for me. So I'm very happy to introduce Stéphane Elbaz, who was an active member of the organization of Thai Paris, I've said already before. And I'm very happy to have you in Paris for your talk. So welcome, Stéphane. Thank you, Jean-François. Uh, what an introduction, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> I was joking yesterday saying like I, was, I would prepare a poem for Jean-François to start with, but I was joking, I didn't finish the poem. I started it, but I didn't finish it. But like privately, I, I could read it to you. Okay, um, okay so Jean-François said uh, a lot of things about like what, I, what I've been doing the last, uh, the past, so I've been in New York for what, like about 10 years? And Jean-François described it a bit, like my, what I've been doing. Uh, I'm going to uh, open the talk. And um, there's like few things I'm going, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm going to uh, detail. Oh. oh, it's already there, okay. So, um, so I called the talk later screens and time. Uh, I'm trying to have a sequence of projects, uh, like all the things I'm doing, like web products and like, uh, and like how I always go back to typography. I always go back and forth between uh, uh, the screens, the web product, uh, the digital product and typography. And like sometime I combine them, but not all the time. Uh, and like the effect of time over the thing and how the, th uh, like how the time works with like these different projects. So first thing, uh, so, in 2008, I'm still in Paris. I'm about to leave to New York. And uh, we've been contacted by um, um, Christophe Renard, who's the art director of Stiletto Magazine. And um, me and uh, Félix de Marne from Chéri Studio. And we work, um, we help him on the redesign of uh, the Stiletto Magazine. So Stiletto Magazine is a fiction and luxury magazine. And quite frankly, it was pretty good to uh, work on such a project before moving to New York because there's nothing that's French as something like that. Like, uh, so I'll go fast on, the, on this kind of project, but uh, I'll show you quickly what the work we've done. Um, so we started with the uh, nameplate, the logo, and um, so <laughs> sometime I could be a bit conceptual, but not that much actually, but uh, this time we, with Felix, <laughs> you can see that actually we made a Dido to look fashion, and you can see that the the terminals look like actually stiletto shoes, right? <laughs> so it's quite literal. Uh, and uh, we all, what's also uh, interesting is that we, we also like remove some, oh, I don't have a pointer. We remove some flesh in the middle here, right? So it was an interesting feature. We did that for the S to uh, remove the flesh at the top and the bottom to give some character to the, to the lettering. It was like a bit, um, that's a bit more aggressive than an average Dido or Bodoni. Oh, we broke everything. I 
Okay, so the, so we started with the nameplate, um, and we're mm, fairly happy with it. So like some in use of the, and then we st we moved to like do uh, some headline typeface. That's funny this thing, all right? <laughs> uh, so we started to do like a head headline typeface for the magazine based on the logo. So we did um, we did uh, two optical um, two optical weights for the condensed version, and we had made something larger, and like feel like almost like a skeleton version of a Dido, with like kind of like it's already the contrast between like the round shape and the like rectangular shapes to make it like a bit like basically look fashiony and cool. Um, and uh, well, yeah, here's here uh, in context. And when we did that, actually, we brought back some of the flesh in these terminals, actually, to like work better with the rest of the alphabet. So I'm going just through the different version of the types. That's a very high contrast. And that this one is the large one that is like almost a skeleton version. Um, so one, two more in use, and I'll go to the next project. Um, actually, um, it was a fun project. And uh, I was a bit surprised that the, I mean, the, we work with uh, Christophe Renard and uh, I was thinking while I was doing it, like, well, it looks cool. I'm happy to work on this project. It's very difficult to use though. So they, um, they kept using for like a couple or three years and they moved to something else. They kept the masthead, but like, I think that then they, they actually they made a larger format of the magazine, but I don't think they used that much these types anymore. But for me, it was a, a great project before moving to New York because as I said before, like, uh, it felt really French when I was arriving in New York. It's like, the, it's chic, it's like Dido, it's like fashion-y, luxury, it was perfect. Um, so then in New York, I started to work for an agency. So what, so working in an agency, the agency was called, uh, is called Code and Series, like quite big agency in New York. Um, and uh, usually I'm going to say we most of the time because basically I'm not the one doing everything. We are like, it's a team of people. So for example, like, First, one of the first projects that, well, I started with, well, actually, to, to like to detail the connection, when, I, when I've been hired, they probably seen like my portfolio and like the stiletto kind of project. I work for like some other fashion and, st and luxury stuff. And, uh, and they like that, the, they, were, they were about to start Vogue.com project. So they looked at my portfolio and said, like, oh yeah, we need to come with us. Um, so I started to work with Vogue and then like later I worked on an interview magazine. And I worked like mainly with a, uh, uh, Brandon Ralph, who's the one of the founder of the company, who's be, who had a great influence on me. So Interview Magazine was one of the first projects I worked on too. Uh, so Interview Magazine is, is, uh, is been founded, I mean, I don't have my notes, but like in the late 70s, I think. And uh, it was famous mainly because it was uh, uh, led by uh, Andy Warhol. Um, and uh, you can recognize like all these, these covers are um, from the 80s are uh, very iconic covers with these uh, uh, Bernstein illustrations. Uh, when I uh, started working on the project in 2011, uh, Fabien Baron and Steele and uh, Carl, Carl Templer are leading the, the art direction and the editorial direction of the magazine. Uh, and uh, I think Interview is still a landmark in New York, uh, even today, for luxury, like basically it's culture, uh, trans culture, fashion, luxury. And it's like a, it's like a, it's very large format it's, uh, and uh, always like with very good photography. Um, so uh, Fabien Baron uh, gave this aesthetic. I think it's an interesting aesthetic actually. Uh, you see like he's, he's having, well, he used this uh, Scotch Roman. Uh, you see like a lot of capitalization. It's like really <laughs> fashion over function. You can't really read this. Uh, and he's using that this like black bar. It basically is like the it looks like a manual composition when you use like to like put blocks of text in a frame. But like the, these black black box are kind of fillers between them. But like they're marking black bars instead of being transparent, right? So I use them in different places on, in the magazine. And you see that's uh, so I don't come. I'm going when I start designing. Basically, I don't start from scratch. I'm going to have to adapt uh, this aesthetic to a web product. Now, um, one thing I have to say also that this web, I wanted to start with this website because basically this website is a survivor. Uh, I designed it in 2011. I don't have, I think, one website that old that survived. So like 
basically when you're designing for the web or digital product, you're basically it's ephemeral. It's designed to be dead in a couple of years. It can survive like Reaper. This one is like a, it's, a, it's an exception, uh, but like it's, I'm surprised that it's, it lasted like that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's surprising. Anyway, uh, I think it it's, uh, was important to me, so I'm going to just play this, but uh, at this point, like working with Brandon, uh, we were looking at the analytics and we first we figured a lot of things that actually um, kind of shaped my mindset for the future project. A lot of like mechanism of things I've seen here helped me conceptualize future projects. So, so like the aesthetic uh, was kind of sad, but like the way we, we adapted it for the web was, was like interesting. So first thing we did is, so at this time, 2011, um, most web publications try to put everything at the top of the page. We have this, called, this thing called the fold. So like it's something coming from the print, you know, the fold is like the thing you see at the top of the page. Like when you're folding a newspaper, it's like what you see above. Uh, so f that's the first thing we wanted to break. It's like we, we kind of like this, in we had this instinct that actually people would be scrolling anyway. Um, and actually, with analytics, we figured actually that's what they were doing. Anyone would scroll the page, right? At this time, it was not like obvious, but like other thing we discovered actually is people were not like clicking on navigations. So they were not like going into menu and say click on like video section or fashion section. Fashion section. Better? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we didn't put like a navigation bar at the top. And these things on the side were not actually navigations. It was not a menu. We don't jump you to another page. It, was, it would be an anchor that would drive you down the page. So we tried to place everything that we thought was relevant for the users inside the page itself and not uh, inside a menu, right? So I'm going to play the Okay, yeah. So, so we built the page to, to like surface all the sections inside. Everything we saw like from each section that were relevant for the user, we would fit it inside the home page. And we use these like large blocks to like basically segment the page and surface like the different sections. So basically instead of having, and you see we brought back a, a navigation at the top, but just after you start scrolling. So the main, the main takeaway from this is, is that it's like we figured that actually like people don't engage with like UX, navigation, and all these kind of things. Like people engage with content. If you think something is relevant for the user, just like, like promote it inside the page. If it's not relevant, like you can bury inside the navigation, but like basically no one, no one to, go, to go there. Uh, also like during this, pro during this project, I started to do like motion mockups. So basically like what you see here, like the say, the way things are like locking and like the way the content scroll at the, on the side. Um, this was fairly new at the time. Like that's like, um, yeah, it was fairly new at the time and uh, there's no way we could have explained that to a client without having all like a build, like a, a developer spending some time to put it in motion or like me doing like a motion visual to like explain to the client. And that's where actually I, I realized that motion was a key component of like visual design. We couldn't, we couldn't just uh, stick to like make static comps and show it to the client. It has to be like, basically like all the screens were like motion devices. Right? Um, so there was one, like that was the, the two biggest takeaway. Uh, and like one other thing that is funny is like, one thing that is difficult on the web is um, you're doing templates. Most of the time you're doing templates, um, for publishing platforms I mean, you're doing templates. So for example, like when you have like here, Sam Richardson. So this is the intended uh, type size, right? Now, uh, if you go to the next slide, you see this long Schwarzenegger name cannot fit in this width w with like such a, lo such a long name, right? So first thing is like basically, <laughs> Now each time I'm doing a, a column of body copy, I just make sure that I can fit Schwarzenegger in it. That's my <laughs> test word. So that's the first thing. Two, like at this time, we just figured a way to adapt. So we have an intended size and we just like dynamically, you had like the right, adapt the size of the font and the type setting to fit the column, right? So again, like it's 2011, that was fairly new at the time, right? So that's it for interview. Now, uh, Jean-François talked about this project, uh, Genio, so that I finished at, at Typo Fondry. So I'll go quickly about it. I just want to present what was the, 
the idea of it. So I started working on, on this thing. And what I had in mind was to do something like a between actually a type machine. So I'm not very knowledgeable about type typewriters. Uh, so like for example, I, I searched, I Googled something. I Googled like I know it's a famous brand of, of uh, uh, Remington is a famous brand of, of typewriter. And um, so I, I know I wanted to have like this kind of like typewriter fitting, but like mixed with something else. So that's the typewriter. Uh, and uh, mixed with something more like organic, more floral. So I started designing these things. So I had like this kind of uh, like very thin, very low contrast. The serif were like as thick as the stems. And like I had like this kind of like bracketed, uh, uh, bracketed serif at the top that looks very mechanical. And I had like this round curve that were like more organic. And I was started playing with these uh, open counters. So I applied these open counters to uh, many shapes in the alphabet. I mean, the weirdest one was this one. The G was like really weird. <laughs> and uh, it ended up being looking like that. So I, I was mainly working on the, on the scene weight first. And um, so I hope he has this kind of feeling. It's like half like something that feels a bit like typewriter, but like also like kind of organic, like more traditional. Uh, and then I extended the project to uh, like more weights, and so like for example, like here, like the there's no typewriter. It's like you, I, you totally lose it if you like have this kind of weight. But uh, but uh, it was like really like something that helped me learn how to like basically I had to rationalize a project, build a larger family. Um, basically, it was like a really like a long exercise to uh, and like Jean Francois was uh, totally instrumental in this to help me like finalize this project actually. So yeah. So I have more types, you see. Yeah, some text and um, the scene weight again. The italics are more traditional a bit, but I keep the open counters in them. That's it. Later, 2012, um, so I've been contacted by Florence Bellisson at BOTC to uh, work on a Sephora uh, brand typeface. And uh, um, so she sent me the, she, they had an idea already of what they wanted to do with Sephora. They have like a typeface ID. So I contacted Jean-Francois and the craft to help me with the project and work together. So, and this is like a few like uh, application of it at starting. So you see like they came with this idea of like, because Sephora is like the stripes brand. They have the stripes on all their store and they have like a small sign with stripes and they wanted to put the stripes inside the letters, right, to apply the visual, the, the stripes language inside the text. And uh, um, what they sent first was uh, Century Gothic. Uh, that's the, they were the starting point. Like you need, Century Gothic is like used, it's like a Futura, it's very fashionable, you've seen in a lot of, it's very popular in fashion magazines. And usually like um, when we receive this kind of project, we just say like, oh, we don't say like, oh cool, we're going to like, uh, like take Century Gothic and put some stripes and like put it in a software and like send it back to you. Uh, usually, I mean, uh, not usually, we never do that actually. <laughs> we never do anything like that. Um, you, we look at the problem, at the concept and then, then start working on what would be the optimal shape for it. So that's the, the sans serif uh, I designed for. Um, and uh, you see like there's for example like the R is very narrow here, it's loud, wider here the D is, the D is also in the wider and uh, it looks like we could say like it loses a bit of elegance but at the same time like we are trying to optimize to have like a better readability and better, better impact so all the decision we made was based on the stripe system so we made a lot of like design decision to make it sure actually we, w we get the best trade between the effect and the readability. So for example, like here, is v I mean, it's very cool, like this like very geometric C and the narrow S, but uh, when, you, well, when you apply the stripes, for example, like having these kind of terminals finishing that way, basically reveal more of the letter shape and, and therefore like make it more readable. So I was being, so usually it's like this kind of like, uh, I take a typeface and I take my scissors and I shape some stuff. 
usually doesn't work really well. You need to spend some time figuring out like what kind of shit you're doing. Um, then, uh, thanks to the craft uh, uh, capacities, we made a script uh, in the open type to make it much easier to apply these identities throughout the whole document. Because, you know, it was supposed to be applied to uh, many countries. So basically we wanted to make it very easy to make it look the way it was intended uh, uh, from the get-go. So basically this was like a, a script that you, like anyone would like start typing and like basically would like distribute the shapes in a specific uh, order to optimize the look of the text. And um, at the end there's like, a, so I don't know, if there was like, a, a, um, I can replay it maybe. At the end you'll see like there's like a transparent character where you can like switch from one set to another to help like create some more variations. But uh, it's like actually it's really cool that we've been able to do something that is that complete in terms of like a execution where the designer just had to install the font and pretty much like hold this work of picking what, where do I put like filled in, filled in letters, where do I do stripes is pretty much done for it, for him. The character set, so there's some these are some Cyrillic and some Greek. So you see, is in application in Russia, in Greece, in like in Turkey, in like many countries in China. And uh, here is like few applications when they release the project. So uh, again, it's the art direction of France Bison. She 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 made some st uh, she commissioned some photography to make some stunning photo, kind of like psychedelic. I don't know, like a, it's really cool photography to go with it. That's it. Now, LA Times. Uh, so after that, I worked uh, with Scott and Siri again for LA Times. So like, what LA Times is a it's a it's a big publication. It's a big newspaper. Basically, it's the New York Times of the West Coast. So it was a huge project for me. I mean, even for Scott and Siri, I think I mean I don't see a lot of like New York Times w like don't do don't take an agency to redesign their website. It's too big. They do it internally, so it was like a kind of a lifetime opportunity for